She's okay. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the 66th meeting of the Literacy Research Association. I am Gay Ivey, Vice President and Co-Chair with Becky Rogers of the 2016 program. Thank you for attending the conference here in Nashville and for arriving on time for this session. Please take a few minutes to turn off your cell phones or set them on vibrate. Thank you. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few announcements and today's brief agenda. First, please visit our exhibitors, Teachers College Press in Guilford in the registration for your area. We appreciate them and their continued support of LRA. Also, please stop by the registration area to participate in the LRA book display and silent auction. Your silent auction bid number is on the back side of your badge. We have had many publishers graciously donate books authored by LRA members, and they are available for bid until Friday afternoon at 3.30 p.m. If you have not already done so, please download the LRA 2016 Annual Conference mobile app. It's brand new this year and very interactive. If you first download the guidebook app from the Apple Store or Google Play Store on your mobile device, you can then search within the app for the LRA 2016 Annual Conference. If you need help downloading the app, please stop by the registration desk and LRA staff will be happy to assist you. Make sure that you attend the Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Session with Dr. Alan Luke in this ballroom at 3 o'clock p.m. this afternoon. Dr. Luke will be presented with the Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Award at 445 at the beginning of the invited plenary session. His talk will be No Grand Narrative in Sight, Double Consciousness, Place, and Politics of Literacy. Following Dr. Luke's plenary address, please join us in the town hall meeting at 615 in Broad Broadway Ballroom F. The agenda for today's session includes the presentation of the J. Michael Parker Award. This will be followed by the introduction and presentation of the Oscar Causey Award. And then Dr. Freddie Hebert will deliver the Os Oscar Causey Address. Now, I'd like to introduce Sylvia Nogueron Liu, who will present the J. Michael Parker Award to this year's recipient. Sylvia. Um, hello, I'm Sylvia Nogueron Liu, and I'm here to present the J. Michael Parker Award, which is a uh, it honors the memory of J. Michael Parker and his interest in adult literacy research. It also pays for uh, annual conference expenses for a doctoral student or an untenured professor. The award is intended to encourage research in adult literacy. Um, the award is given to a paper capable of making a significant contribution to theory and practice of adult literacy learning and instruction. So the paper selected has an appropriate strong methodology and impact to the field. now I would like to acknowledge the hard work of the award committee members reviewing the submissions. This is a dream team. It is a joy to share our enthusiasm in the difficult task of selecting a winner from all the amazing papers reporting new work in the field. So thank you for your service. And if you're here, I'll ask you to please feel free to stand as I read your names. We have Leah Sal from Loyola University, Maryland, Maryland and Debbie East, um, the Launchpad Consultants, Amy Burke, Te Texas Women's University, Kathleen Riley, Mississippi State University, and Jennifer Smith from Austin College. So I'll ask you to uh, clap to acknowledge the work. Thank you for volunteering. And here's a slide with the past winners. And the, so you can see some of the faces of the past winners of the award. Let's go really quick. <laughs> okay, so. This year's winner captures the spirit and intent of the award in important ways, in addition to the paper's implications for research and practice. 
The author reports six years of ethnographic research in the paper titled Tensions Between Vulnerability and Public Literacy Spaces. Writers at a homeless shelter negotiate personal narratives for community. This work examines the contradictions of this space, the public readings in sponsors, and the author's own role as a facilitator, creating and disrupting the composing process. Please welcome this year's winners of the J. Michael Parker Award, Dr. Rosina Samora Lou from the University of Iowa. Thank you very much to LRA and to the J. Michael Parker Award Committee members and committee chair, Sylvia Noger and Lou. I am sincerely grateful for this recognition. As a writer and a writing teacher, I understand very well the intimacy of sharing drafts with others. And for this reason, I want to thank my colleagues at the University of Iowa for their willingness, especially Amanda Tyne, for her willingness to read my draft all the way to the 11th hour. I want to thank her and my other colleagues too, Carolyn Colvin, Renita Schmidt, and Bonnie Sunstein for their mentorship this past year and a half. They say that behind every success, there are a whole bunch of women right by your side, and that cannot be any truer for me. And last, but most importantly, as a writer and writing teacher, I am especially thankful for the 100 plus men and women who have allowed me to write alongside them each week inside the Community Stories Writing Workshop at a homeless shelter and at the VA. Through these intimate exchanges, they have taught me things about writing and writers, reading and readers that I otherwise would not have known or have overlooked due to my own oversight. They have informed for me, if not disrupt, what literacies I and we privilege and importantly, whose. This paper is thus perhaps one of the most important reflections I have written thus far on my six year and ongoing ethnographic study of the workshop and the public events that it sponsors. At the skin, this paper is about the dominant deficit discourses that frame public expectations of writers and, re and writing, particularly those, excuse me, <clears throat> who are homeless and who are poor. Audiences, for example, come to this re these readings with preconceived notions of who they imagine the writers to be and what kinds of stories they presume the writers will tell. Stories about being homeless and being poor as if that is the only thing they can write. These stories the audience then could say that they bore witness to, even though such empathy is neither real nor sustainable, they being consumers of another's trauma. The risks for community writers are therefore at least twofold. Not only do they risk the emotional consequences of talking about painful past with strangers, they risk essentializing, fetishizing their homelessness. What is intended as public access to writing and reading opportunities conjunctionally becomes public access to writers' personal vulnerability. At the heart then, this paper is also a paper about accountability, ours as educators, and as community members to examine our own roles and responsibilities in sponsoring literacy spaces for public access. I cannot thank LRA enough for creating this space and recognizing this kind of work. I am deeply humbled. Thank you. Congratulations, Rosina, and thank you so much, Sylvia. We now turn to the Oscar Causey Award. 
Dr. Bridget Dalton, a member of the Oscar Causey Award Committee, will in introduce the award criteria and the committee members. Then, as is the tradition with this award, the previous winner reveals the new awardee. Dr. Susan Newman, who was previously awarded with this honor, will reveal the new awardee and then introduce Freddie Hebert, last year's Oscar Causey Award winner. So first, Bridget Dalton. Thank you and good morning. Whoops. I'm trying to advance the slide. Shall I use this instead? You hear that dinging, don't you? You'd never know that my research area is technology and medicine. <laughs> I won't, Susan. There we go. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. So the Oscar S. Kazi Award. This award is awarded annually to honor an LRA member for outstanding contributions to reading research. Dr. Oscar S. Kazi was the founder of LRA and served many years as chair of the executive committee. There are six criteria for this award. The first three focus on the author's scholarly publications. Has the individual published substantial research in literacy, significant research in literacy, and original research in literacy. Then, has the individual generated new knowledge through literacy research? Fifth, has the, is the individual a recognized leader in the conduct and promotion of literacy research? And finally, we give consideration to whether the literacy research of the Oscar S. Causey Award nominees is aligned with the mission statement of LRA. I want to acknowledge the members of our committee and um, I'm going to ask that you stand. Well, first, uh, Lori Henry, who is the chair of this committee, is not able to be here um, today. Uh, Mary McVie, Luz Murillo, Aria Razfar, Lisa Zawalinski, and Bogum Yoon. Please join me in thanking them for all of their hard work on this committee. Let's take a moment to uh, acknowledge this illustrious uh, group of uh, recipients of the Oscar Cause S. Causey Award, um, which initiated back in 1967. So this shows from 67 to 1993. And then from 94 to 2015, our current award awardee. Hmm. Extra slide, perhaps? Oh, there we go. Let me go back. That's the essential slide, yes, Susan? Um, so I'm going to turn it over now to the next person. <laughs> Susan, all right, Susan, come on up. <laughs> Is it just a, a quick over here? It just came in. Just the arrow? Yes. Well, good morning, everyone. Remember, I'm early childhood, so we, we do it again. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Great. Well, you know, I thought last year was going to be hard. Uh, I gave the Oscar Kazi uh, Award, but this one is even harder for me because I found out who the Oscar Kazi Award winner was two weeks ago, and I had to keep a secret. 
And I don't keep secrets very well. I always said that if I ever had an affair, my husband would be the first one to know about it because I just can't keep a secret. But one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to start with a focus. I call it the, whisker, the winter of our discontent. Um, many of us have seen a, a shocking change in our country. And I always think of how hard it has been. But what I want to do is I want to turn this around and be optimistic today and talk about the wonderful opportunities that lie ahead for us, especially in these next four years, and how it relates to our Oscar Kazi winner. First thing I want to acknowledge is that big hair is in, <laughs> that we can now tease and color and change and do all sorts of things, cover various bald spots and whatever, and it's good. And the second thing is I think that we've learned that we can be really, really rude. That as many of you know, we, I'm from New York, and we're nasty. We're not nice. In fact, last night I was just shocked when the, when the cabbie asked me, how are you? But you, you know now we can all be sort of rude and nasty and say whatever we want to to reviewers who we hate because it's good. It's okay. But the other thing that's in is that we can lie. It, I mean, just think of the possibilities of what we can do here. We can give research talks in new ways and say that we have very significant results when we don't. I mean, it's okay. So what I decide to do today is I decide in this new genre that we're now facing that I would announce the Oscar Kazi Award and put in a few little lies so I can cover my secrets, which I am not terribly good at. The first thing I would like to make a causal argument. This person grew up um, and, and began in the year of rock and roll. And I know that we're not supposed to make causal arguments here. We have to be very careful. But there is something about rock and roll that provided a opening. Um, all of a sudden, the years of Perry Como and Vic Damone were, were gone. And what we were beginning to see is a greater diversity in our music, in what we valued. And there was wonderful Elvis and Chuck Berry, and there was uh, Fats Domino and, and Ray uh, Charles. And what I'd like to say is that ended up and changed some of the, the, the things we were thinking at uh, the time. It was not just right to be white any longer. It was not just okay to have Wonder Bread. And we sort of didn't believe that you know, it builds strong bodies, this wonderful white bread in eight different ways. What we began to understand is that diversity matters, diversity in our foods, in our flavors, in our ways of being, and this is good. And this is the environment that our Oscar Kazi grew up in, that we began to recognize the wonderful diversity in our country and prize that diversity in very sincere ways. This Oscar Kazi winner, are you getting the secret slowly or no? Okay, good. Um, this Oscar Kazi award winner um, was around, oops, I have, uh, uh, was, uh, was around in a certain time when our, uh, ma many of our major theorists became very prominent. Uh, we talked about Jean Piaget and the theory of cognitive development. And we talked about the art of knowing and Jerome Bruner and Lev Vygotsky, though he lived many years before, became much more prominent in our thinking and our ways of being. But the most um, significant thinker of um, our Oscar Kazi winner was actually our brand new education secretary, who is Betsy DeVos, who was very close in views in terms of her views of vouchers and charters and non-public schools. In fact, it was very, oops, wrong. It was actually Paulo Ferreri that was very influential in this person's thinking. And actually, this person knew that um, scholar, that phenomenal scholar. 
Our Oscar Kazi winner grew up in a small town, and that small town was very transformative in our OC's winner uh, lives. Uh, like many uh, small towns across the country, there were frictions and between factions, there were racially related disputes, and many people would, would say that some of these small towns, though beautiful and bu bucolic, often had terrible health uh, considerations for miners and other kinds of factory working. But instead of leaving that town and just dismissing it, this Oscar Kazi winner sought to understand it and sought to try to understand some of the, the things that were remarkable about this town, the examples of resilience and how people in such adversity came back. Is it getting closer? This person is further uh, loved and cherished by a wonderful family, a close family. And this person says, our Oscar Kazi winner said that um, the person's mother, I, I'm being careful not to genderize, uh, was very, very um, important to the person. <laughs> and <laughs> it's getting harder and harder to do that. And what that meant is that cultural diversity became something very special, that we no longer thought of assimilation in any way. We realized that the strength of this country is based on the cultural pluralism that we bring, that all of us feel strongly and are stronger by that cultural pluralism. And this association and this person will stand by that in the next four years where that will be challenged again and again. And what we'll see is that person is also very interested in space, not necessarily in space travel, but in space in a very different way. Are you getting it? Not yet? But the space can be considered in a very different way. In other words, very often we have this notion about learning. It's after school, it's school, it's an institution. But this person recognized that it's not an institutional phenomenon. It is a malleable factor that children can learn in and out of school, and that creates a third space. This person has very influential and wonderful friends, Michael Cole, Michael Rose, uh, Alan Luke, uh, Barbara Rogoff. Notice how, how clever I did that with the circles missing. <laughs> and has influenced some of our most powerful uh, politicians and people in the press. In fact, I know this person is going to be on the phone shortly, contacting our Oscar Kazi winner, knowing, wanting to know about education policy. But actually, it's a very fine individual that has contacted, literally, this person to understand how we can embrace a more inclusive view of early education. And so when I asked this Oscar Kazi winner, how do you do it all? How are you so incredibly productive and so active in your community and with so many people? What do you do during your free time? And again, it comes back to friends and family. These are the mentees of the people that have grown through her wonderful work. Oops, I did a gender. And a family who loves and grandchild and son who she loves. These are her colleagues um, right now at her university, which has uh, embraced her and her wonderful work. Do you have it yet? And today, I would like to honor our Oscar Kazi winner, Chris Katera. Thank you. 
I always wanted an Oscar. <laughs> so they give me two minutes. So thank you, Susan. Keeping that secret was hard for me too. Um, I'm so humbled to receive this award as it is difficult to imagine myself in the company of previous honorees whose work I, for, I have admired for so long. It's also difficult to imagine as my own early academic trajectory was an extraordinarily steep climb. I never attended elite institutions, and yet I've had the privilege of living most of my professional life, working with and learning from extraordinary colleagues and gifted and principled students at two of the very best institutions, UCLA and now UC Berkeley, go Bears, and of course with my wonderful colleagues in, in Colorado. And spaces like LRA and AERA have been critical to my intellectual and professional journey, and for that I thank you. But those of you who know my work know that historicity is an important dimension in my study of people's learning. So I want to take a quick moment to historicize and acknowledge the roots of my insatiable desire to learn and to leverage that knowledge for the social good. This meeting is bittersweet for me. A year ago, I had to leave LRA early as my mother became gravely ill and passed away shortly after. I want to acknowledge her and my 91-year-old dad, as they are the people from whom I learned most. I'm a fourth-generation Chicana from Miami, Arizona, daughter of a gifted teacher's aide and copper miner who made learning and education central everyday practices and aspirations. Although my father had shift work, as is true for miners whose work is distributed around the clock, he and my mother never missed a single parent-teacher conference, a school event, a PTA meeting, or anything school-related. And I was in everything. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Trips to the public library were a regular practice for our family. We lived on the same street as the public library. And it would not be out of the ordinary for my parents to help me do library research for projects. Or, or they might consult the beautiful set of world book encyclopedia volumes that were part of our home library. It is no surprise that I went to the university and that teaching, learning, and literacy became my focus and passion. So thank you, Mary and Frank Gutierrez. You are the salt of the earth that I tried to see and honor in all I do. Thank you. It's a great honor for me now to introduce the Oscar Kazi winner of last year, 2015, Alfreda Hebert. This is a hard thing to say, and I'm so glad you are Freddie, because that's what she is more well known as. Freddie, as you know, has had a long and storied career, prolific um, in her work. Um, in my uh, looking at her vita, I counted 198 chapters, books, and articles, and I'm sure I've left out a number. She has been a teacher's aide, right? A teacher, a teacher educator, a researcher, a policymaker. And she is more, what, what is wonderful about Freddie is she's more energetic than ever before. You're still going and going so strong. <laughs> she's currently president of Text Project Inc. and has been a professor at UC Berkeley, Michigan, where she and I sort of went one way and the other, University of Col Colorado, and University of Kentucky. She was Center Director, Dir, Director of Sierra, the Center for the Improvement of Early Reading Achievement. I think I have that right. And aside from that and her many, many accomplishments, I've had experience that she's a lovely woman and warm individual. 
I asked a colleague of mine, Martha Adler, tell me something a little bit about Freddie. And she said, you know what? You come to the West Coast and there's always a room. There's always a room for you. There's always a welcome mat at her door. She's known for her wonderful and, and infectious sense of humor, which I think we're going to hear today. And I didn't know this, but you're also known as a social director at, in Santa Cruz, where you work with many people in your community and helping many uh, children at the same time. Finally, she's known <laughs> now this, I don't know if other people know, you're, you're known to dance to victory songs. and that you like We Are the Champions, and you might do one today, I hope. With great pleasure, please welcome Freddie Hebert, our 2015 Oscar Kazi Award winner. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks very much, uh, Susan, for the warm-up. Usually I get put into that role of um, needing to warm up the crowd, but I feel like you're all right here and ready. And if I got chosen to do this because I'm funny, I'm not gonna be as funny as I usually um, can do. Um, I know that when I gave the Jean Chawl um, lecture at Harvard and I stood up and said that I was gonna do it straight, everyone groaned um, with disappointment. So reading, by definition, involves text. But when it comes to defining and describing text, we have a lot of different perspectives. Now, I was an early adopter of an alternative views of text, following in the steps of Ken and Yetta Goodman. In my first two published studies, I looked at young children's understanding of print in the environment, such as on these signs. My work actually spurred several investigators to determine whether young children could recognize environmental print independently. And what they did is they would transpose for example, a Coca-Cola, the words Coca-Cola on a stop sign, and then conclude that young children couldn't independently recognize environmental print. Now, that had never been my intent, to have young children independently recognize environmental print. My interest lay in having young children's understanding of the meaningfulness of print come into tasks such as that of becoming conventionally literate. Further, even as an early adopter of alternative views of text, I was always aware that at one point or another, individuals, if they want to participate fully in communities and in the workplace, need to have conventional literacy. And I was also aware that for children who live in economic, linguistic, and social communities that differ from that of the school, the texts of school are very important in making that possible for them to become conventionally literate. Now, surprisingly, in that texts are central to our enterprise as literacy scholars, we have few models of texts. An exception to this is a framework that Heidi Ann Mesmer, Jim Cunningham, and I outlined in 2012. In that paper, we argued that selection and creation of text for beginning readers needed to attend to programmatic, discourse, syntactic, and word level features. And today, I build on that model extending it to texts for struggling readers. And always in my presentation today, as has been the case in my 50 years in education, 
And as Susan said, first as a teacher aide, then a teacher, teacher educator and researcher. My focus is on the kids who depend on public schools to become highly literate. Now, I want to be clear in using that term that I'm not suggesting by any stretch of the imagination that these children don't come to school with many literacies and substantial knowledge. But for them to become conventionally literate requires intentional instruction on the part of our public schools. And please know that when I use this phrase, I speak as the child of refugees to Canada, a child whose native language wasn't English, a child who came from a very strange religious ethnic group that the teachers couldn't understand. And know that I stand here today because of teachers in Vancouver, British Columbia's public schools who took special care with this unusual child as they did with all the children in my classes. And these were children who had come from Hungary in 1956, Sikhs, Hindus, Pakistanis who had been displaced by partition, and people from the displaced camps of World War II, as well as children like me whose parents had ex escaped from the Stalinists as the Iron Curtain was closing. Let me give you an overview of my presentation. As with all of my presentations, it's going to have three parts. Now, some people um, say that my proverbial use of a three-part presentation reflects the fact, and I forgot to show you these wonderful children who depend on schools to become highly illiterate. So some say that my um, proverbial use of three parts, especially the therapists I've interacted with over the years, um, <laughs> reflects the fact that I learned to read with Dick and Jane, who suffered from obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> they did everything three times, like jumping and running. So in the first part of the presentation, I examine a text innovation that has become ubiquitous in the six years since the Common Core Standards launch. In the second part, I describe a framework of text with fairly broad brushstrokes. And finally, I look at my conclusions in relation to future research, especially the research that I'm going to be doing in the next phase of my career. And Susan, I don't understand why I'd be slowing down. It was just some kind of ageism. I, I don't believe in that. So, okay, so on to the illustration. This new text solution consists of current events articles from newspapers and websites. Now, there's nothing unusual about that. What is unique is the presence in these programs of a text at each of the readability levels of the Common Core State Standards. So here's the staircase of text complexity that the Common Core writers presented. Actually, they hypothesized that the levels that students needed to attain at specific steps were required if they were to attain college and career um, levels by high school. Here's what's offered in one of these programs. On the right-hand side, you can see the levels. So you've got the choice of one of these five levels that match perfectly onto the staircase of text complexity. This is a compelling idea. With a click or two, each student can be provided with just the right text, or what my friend Steve Stahl used to call Goldilocks text. But is it true that these adapted texts increase the reading capacity of struggling readers? When I couldn't find answers to this question in the literature, I conducted a study. And what I did is I established the critical features of text and then I compared those features to what we know in the archival literature. My study consisted of 500 leveled magazine articles, five texts representing each of these five Lexile levels from one program, and the program is Newzella. But the patterns are similar in other programs such as Achieve 3000 and Read 180. 
These programs I'm going to collectively call level magazine programs. As this chart shows, mean sentence length and number of words increase as text levels increase. Okay, so the lowest texts are on the left hand side, highest texts on the right. On word frequency, the Lexile analyzer's measure of semantics, the pattern is opposite. Word frequency decreases with higher levels. That's actually what you'd expect because lower levels on the word frequency measure mean on average harder words. So here's what the proficient readers get. Here's what the least proficient readers get. So if struck, just keep thinking that there are millions of kids actually getting this as we speak today. So if struggling readers get the lowest level text, they read texts that are 41% as long as those for proficient readers, sentences that are slightly less than half as long, and words with higher average frequency. Now, are these features validated by research? That is, do short texts with short sentences and words with higher average frequency increase the reading capacity of struggling readers? On the feature of short text, I'm going to review findings related to reading volume later in the presentation. But to foreshadow those results, let me quote from Jay Samuels, who served on the National Literacy Panel in 2000 and had this to say about the panel's conclusions on independent reading with which he didn't agree. If amount of time spent reading isn't associated with reading proficiency, Reading is the only human endeavor that follows this pattern. Second, do short sentences help poor readers comprehend better? Now, it is the case that long sentences are associated with more complex ideas, at least in expository text. That's not the case with narrative text. But does putting clauses and phrases into separate sentences help poor readers comprehend? In his dissertation, which was published in 1974, David Pearson looked at students' comprehension as a function of complex sentences, such as this one. And simple sentences that had been made from a complex sentence. Comprehension was the same or better on the more complex than simple sentences. David suggested that rewriting the ideas as two sentences eliminates the causal relationship, placing a greater inferential load on readers. By the mid-1980s, when I worked on Becoming a Nation of Readers, the findings on the effect of shortening sentences to get lower readability levels was substantial enough that the co um, commission cautioned against over-reliance on readability formulas for creating or selecting reading text. In fact, we wanted to call for a moratorium on readability formulas, but Jean Chaw, whose name was associated with a pretty major readability formula at that point, was on our commission and was having none of it. Subsequent research has continued to show that shortening sentences isn't an aid to comprehension. For example, in a study that colleagues and I published in 2011, texts were written with different levels of syntactic and lexical complexity. Lower lexical complexity had a significant positive effect on comprehension on two of the four topics. Syntactic changes, either harder ones or easier, didn't influence comprehension of any topic. Now, the finding of a, an effect for lexical complexity is one of the most enduring in our field. But the word frequency outcome of the Lexile framework simply gives an average of the frequencies of all the words in a text. An average for word frequency is a problem because of the skewed distribution of English vocabulary. Around 100 words appear a 1,000 times per million words, and then we have another 375,000 words that appear less than once per million with about half of those words appearing once every 10 or 20 million words. To illustrate the meaninglessness of this metric, consider these two texts. 
they have the same average word frequency, and it's the word frequency of the most challenging leveled magazine text. So every rare word is treated the same and counted every time, meaning that MAC and TAC are treated similarly to nonlinear and condensation, leading to a similar evaluation of vocabulary load. Until research evidence shows us that this leveling system indeed increases the reading of struggling readers, I have to conclude that a system that relies on syntax and is opaque to vocabulary is unlikely to provide the needed support for, for struggling readers. But how do texts like this happen? Well, one explanation is digital capacity. Text can now be changed very quickly with algorithms and very, very little human uh, involvement. But I say that the bigger source was the decision of Common Core writers to reify an explicit set of quantitative parameters in the staircase of text complexity. Based on the conclusions of becoming a nation of readers, California and Texas in the late 1980s led the way by explicitly mandating that reading text manipulated by readability formulas wouldn't be available for purchase with state funds. From that time till the Common Core, readability formulas haven't been used to change or select text in core reading programs. That's not the case in content area programs, but in reading programs it is. Now, the Common Core writers went a step further than providing the staircase of text complexity based on the Lexile framework to appease other companies that charge for analyzing for text complexity. They actually provided an addendum with other quantitative indices, and this was the only modification they were willing to make to the Common Core. I say that such an action is more than tacit approval for changing and assigning text based primarily on the criterion of sentence length. This illustration demonstrates the urgency and need of attention to my thesis. For a large portion of our population to become highly literate, literacy scholars need to provide well-grounded principles and frameworks that counter policies such as the staircase of text complexity, and that give readers grist that support, provide supportive text rather than text that hinder struggling readers. In the second part of the presentation, I'm going to identify three principles that are essential foundations for texts that change the trajectories of struggling readers. But before I describe those principles, I want to be clear that I'm not claiming here today to be comprehensive in my text model. For example, I'm not going to consider narrative and expository text as Nell Duke has done. Neither am I going to examine the ways in which teacher and task scaffolding fosters reader, readers' comprehension of text as Sheila Valencia, Karen Wixon, and David Pearson have done. What I've done is to pick from among the many topics related to text Three, that I believe require extensive and intensive attention from our community. Without such attention, educators are vulnerable to quick fixes that at best maintain the status quo and possibly create even more obstacles to educational opportunity for the students most in need. The first principle for struggling readers is that texts need to be meaningful. Really, Freddie? At first glance, this principle seems so apparent as to be tautological. After all, reading as a language process is focused on meaning. Jim G. tells us that meaning making can take many different forms, but humans, even young humans, approach language, including written language, as if there's going to be some meaning. When students with few prior literacy experiences are asked to read with nonsensical texts, we shouldn't be surprised if they fail to become proficient comprehenders. And nonsensical text is precisely what has formed the primary reading diets of a generation of American school children, 
especially those who are perceived as at risk. These figures are from the textbook adoption in California that was mandated during No Child Left Behind. And these remain in many classrooms, especially for interventions, tier two and tier three, in classrooms not just in California, but across the US, beginning with kindergarten, then you get another um, dose in first grade, then in second grade, then in third grade, and finally, interventions for struggling readers and for English learners in grades four through eight. Now I have to admit, when I started this presentation eight months ago, I thought that the term con man was a very meaningless term, and I have since upgraded that to a central core vocabulary. Alongside the strong effect of vocabulary and comprehension is the finding of an equally or even stronger effect of students' background knowledge. Now, the depth and quality of what you know about a word influences how quickly and well you recognize it, according to Chuck Perfetti's lexical quality hypothesis. Yet in decodable text, low-meaning words such as snout, shearing, plow, and nab are numerous. And get this, they're rarely repeated by design. That's part of the design. Because they don't want kids to be memorizing words. They want them to be relying on their decoding. As an antidote to decodables, I created a set of texts for young English learners that first and foremost was based on the principle of meaningfulness. English learners might not know the English label for a concept, but particular concepts are salient in the lives of young children. Concepts such as school, playing, plants, and food. Such familiar but engaging concepts provided the basis for the meaning text. From the target words for a topic, the chosen words were ones with consistent common vowel consonant patterns or rhymes and with substantial frequency in written English. So we picked the words dog and frog, but not cog, bog, slog, and flog. <laughs> with Charlie Fisher, I initiated an intervention with a meaning text in a district with a high percentage of English learners. For 12 weeks, in three half-hour weekly sessions, the same teacher worked with two groups of students from the same class, and there were nine first grade classrooms. They participated in exactly the same instructional routine, lots of writing, lots of wordplay, but 10 minutes of each half hour was devoted to reading text. One group reading the open court decodables, the other the meaning text. A third triplet of students stayed in the classroom where they received instruction in the district's core reading program, which had a second set of decodables. By the second half of first grade, when we started the intervention, these English language learners had been through the 44 phonemes once, in kindergarten, and they were on the second tour. But they, most of them could recognize at best a handful of words. As a result of the intervention, the meeting group outperformed both the intervention and classroom decodable groups in reading several texts, but not a decodable text. The meeting group also outperformed the other two groups on several word recognition tasks, but not a decoding task of nonsense words. That is, when things didn't make sense, better reading skills didn't help these students. The meaning texts were, fit, were filled with familiar concepts, but they also provided some consistency in phonics patterns. The second principle is that texts for struggling readers need to have a modicum of consistency in linguistic information. Now, I've underlined modicum to emphasize that language learning involves generalization. It's not about seeing and practicing every single sound or every single word. In the meaning text, we emphasize 25 phoneme graphing patterns rather than the 250 that are required for a program to be officially labeled as decodable by the states of Texas and California. 
Even representative knowledge about phonics, however, can only go so far. To move beyond the novice stage in reading, students need to be facile with the meaning parts or morphemes of language. And to understand morphology's role in proficient reading requires us as literacy educators to understand the na nature of the lexicon or the vocabulary of English. Estimates place the number of words in English at around 400,000, obviously an impossible number of words to teach. But when viewed from the perspective of morphology, the learning tasks becomes somewhat more manageable. In a landmark study, Bill Nagy and Dick Anderson estimated that the English lexicon could be parsed into 88,500 word families. An example of a morphological family is adequate, adequately, and inadequate. This figure gives the distribution of words in a corpus of 200,000 words. Nagy and Anderson hypothesized that the morphological families become prominent in the text on the right-hand side of the graph when we're rare words become more prominent, as in the middle grades. But in a recent analysis of core reading programs, Devin Kearns, Joanne Carlisle, and I found that 52% of the unique words in grade one text and 65% in grade three text have multiple morphemes. Amanda Goodwin, Gina Cervetti, and I set out to establish the presence of word families in the most frequent portion of the English lexicon, words with a 10 or more predicted appearances per million. We identified 2,500 word families in that group. In a subsequent study, I identified families in the moderately low frequent group here. This group has approximately 1,500 word families. So the words on this side of the graph, those that appear at least once per million, have approximately 4,000 word families. The next step in our research was to establish whether these words appear a lot in text, so a validation study. And what we used were the 200 texts identified by Common Core writers as exemplars of complex texts for different grade levels. These are the 200 texts. Yes, I have compulsively gathered all of them, <laughs> scanned them, or as it's called in my neighborhood where the kids do the scanning, scammed them because they charge quite a bit for this process, and analyze these texts. We found that the 2,500 words families accounted for an average of 91.5% of the words across the board from K to college and career ready. The 1,500 families added an additional 5%, and this leaves a very small percentage accounted for by all the rest of the words. Percentages of these words and word families differed across the grade levels. So at K1, about 97% of the words were accounted for by the 2,500 families. Those are the words in yellow. At grades 11 to college and career ready, 90% of the words came from that 2,500 group, 15% from the um, excuse me, 5% from the 1500 group, which are in orange, and then you see that more rare words are beginning to appear. Now, the presence of a group of highly prolific word families doesn't mean that children use this knowledge when reading. A handful of reviews of morphological studies show that demands of text are high and students can be taught to use these words but we just don't know if kids' knowledge keeps up with the demands of the text. That's something that I intend to investigate in the future. But to date, my work on this corpus has focused on creating texts on this core vocabulary. So I'm referring here to the words with moderate to, low, uh, to high frequency. In designing what I'm calling content text to support struggling readers, I drew heavily on research from the English as a second language field, where a substantial amount of evidence shows that young adults who can read well in their native languages can be taught to read English well and quickly when they move through a progression from highly frequent to moderately frequent to low frequent words. So building on this work, 
I generated a series of word zones in a staircase that was based on vocabulary rather than on syntax. So any text at one of these levels has 98 to 99 percent of the words within that level or from text below that level. But even with this goal of emphasizing the core vocabulary, a chief criterion of these content texts was unmeaningfulness. Whereas current intervention texts for middle graders emphasize a con man shaving sheep, the content texts emphasize topics that are relevant to background knowledge in both narrative and expository texts. So topics such as these, stars, toys, storms, wind farms, so on. Many students have read these texts over the past 15 years, and numerous investigators have studied their effects, concluding that consistent experiences with these texts can increase background knowledge, comprehension, and ease of reading. Now, with any intervention, including the content text, we can ask whether the effects simply reflect that kids are doing more reading, not the specific text or the strategies. We've controlled for that with the content text, but claims for the Level Magazine articles, for example, need to view their results from this lens. Introducing even a little more reading into students' school lives is likely to make a difference, as Jay Samuel said. So the third principle that I'm talking about here today is that struggling readers need to see an awful lot of text to get better at reading. But here's the big question. How much reading is associated with particular levels of reading proficiency is a question we simply don't have an answer to. And I have to say we have almost no research that examines that. How might we begin to answer this question? A first step I propose is to examine present reading habits or patterns. So if students are reading at adequate levels, that should mean that they're participating in enough reading. In a recent study, my colleagues and I compared data from two cohorts reading the same passages, one group in 1960 and another in 2011. We found that silent reading rates with comprehension were significantly lower in 2011 than in 1960, beginning with fourth grade and with a noticeable plateau in the middle grades. Actually, what you can see there is the high school kids are gaining at the same rate as the kids in 1960, but it just isn't enough from where they start. In another study, this time of middle school students' oral and silent reading, colleagues and I found that accuracy levels in oral reading were high. 90% of a sample of 8,000 middle graders could read grade level passages at 95% accuracy. That level scholars such as Steve Stahl and Mari Clay have told us should be satisfactory for comprehension. But we, when we asked them to read silently, 60% of the sample failed to answer a relatively easy set of comprehension questions satisfactorily. What we did is we took a sample of the poor and moderate comprehenders and asked them to read silently in a paper and pencil situation with an observer. In that situation, from the online situation, their comprehension rose significantly and their reading rates declined significantly. Findings such as these suggest to me at least that the vast majority of our students are proficient enough at word recognition, but they don't have the monitoring or stamina needed to read on their own. One explanation for these patterns of poor reading uh, performance may lie in the amount that students read in school. From the early 1970s to the early 1990s, scholars such as Linda Gambrell conducted observational studies of classroom reading. The findings typically showed approximately 14 to 15 minutes spent in daily reading in elementary classrooms. In the early 2000s, a survey by the National Assessment of Educational Progress found fourth graders reporting an average of eight to 12 minutes of daily reading. Now this is the most comprehensive and the most recent to date, and it suggests that the amount that students are reading, which was previously at a fairly moderate level, may have declined. This decline 
and time spent reading has been happening while we've been devoting more time to reading instruction. Devin Brenner, Renarta Tompkins and I found it in classrooms under NCLB mandates in one school, in, one st in an entire state, reading instruction increased by about 50%, but the time students spent reading didn't increase significantly. A compelling finding in the Brenner study was the mode of reading. Students spent half of their time in assisted reading, ostensibly following along as their teachers or an audio tape read the story. This pattern of assisted reading seems to have extended across the grades, as evident in an observational study of high school classrooms as part of the Reading for Understanding initiative. In that study, teachers reading aloud with students presumably following along accounted for 80% of the time spent reading in ELA, social studies, and science. All I have to say is that I think our teachers should be getting pretty good at reading. <laughs> this research is not extensive, but for those students who read more in their classrooms, they in fact do better on the NAEP, as shown by John Guthrie. And in another study by LRA members Melanie Kuhn and Paula Schwogenflugel, an additional 1.8% of the school day spent reading distinguished classrooms with high levels of reading achievement from classrooms with low levels. A study led by Tim Rzynski illustrates the need to dig deeper in terms of volume. What I'm suggesting is it's not just a simple issue of adding more time and expecting more achievement. In the, Rins in the Rosinski study, we found that struggling middle and high schoolers only began to show improvements after they had spent a minimum of 20 hours in an online intervention. In this third and final part of the presentation, I'm going to summarize what I've talked about and describe implications of this work for, pre for future research. So I began with a description of a form of text that swept through the educational marketplace to illustrate that many textual innovations are without roots in theory or research. I then went on to describe two features of text that are essential in the design and selection of text for struggling readers. But before I address those two features, meaningfulness and linguistic consistency, I want to summarize the conclusions regarding reading volume. I think we can agree that our students aren't reading enough. But in response to the question that teachers ask me, how much reading is necessary? We simply don't know how much of what kind of reading is needed when in students' development. Research around reading volume, and especially its role at different points in students' school careers, is one of the most compelling areas of research. And I think there's enough to go around for a lot of emerging scholars to make significant contributions in both practice and scholarship. Now let me um, address the issue of meaningfulness and a modicum of linguistic consistency. In describing these two features, I presented two examples of text in which I've been involved as a developer and researcher. This involvement shouldn't be construed as my search for the holy grail of text. That is a belief that there's going to be one kind of text that's superior to all other kinds of text for all readers of all proficiencies. I truly believe that there are many text types for different readers and different purposes. But at the same time, I do believe that some texts better support some aspects of reading for struggling readers than other text types. What I'm actually proposing here today is that we return to the topic of intentional or in a previous generation, controlled vocabulary. Our colleagues in English as a Second Language make intentional vocabulary a centerpiece of text, and the people that they work with are proficient readers in another language and are very motivated to learn to read English. Yet in American reading instruction, we've dropped this critical feature of learning for struggling readers even as our schools have become more diverse linguistically, economically, and socially. We rightfully 
rejected the Dick and Jane genre in becoming a nation of readers. However, it's important to note that in BNR, we were recommended that primary level texts should meet the technical requirements for a control vocabulary, while at the same time using language and ideas in artful ways. No one had addressed what this meant when California, in their 1988 textbook adoption, mandated that only authentic text, that is trade books, would be acceptable for adoption in that state. This policy was a vast misinterpretation of becoming a nation of readers. As Jill Fitzgerald and colleagues have shown, the number of unique words in text increased substantially from 1987 to 1993, reflecting a lack of focus on core vocabulary. But even with policies for another type of text, decodable ones, in the mid-1990s, repetition didn't enter in. And as I've shown, vocabulary was not represented by design. Now, I'm not suggesting a return to Dick and Jane. They remain in long-term rehab units, <laughs> dealing with their obsessive compulsiveness. But, they, but we do need attention to what it means to have a modicum of meaningful linguistic information in text for struggling readers. The aim of the work that I've described earlier with Amanda Goodwin and Gina Cervetti has been to identify what we call a parsimonious vocabulary. Can we identify the smallest number of word families that account for the greatest proportion of the words in text? Further, the words beyond the parsimonious vocabulary also require attention. This is what Charlie Fisher and I describe as the words that fall beyond the parsimonious vocabulary to encompass the rare and infrequently encountered words. It is to these questions of parsimonious vocabulary and the critical word factor that I'm going to focus on in the next phase of my career. In pursuing this work, I'm particularly interested in resources provided by digital capacity. Efforts such as the level magazine texts are a poor use of the capacities of technology. For example, technology has made a wealth of databases available where words are tagged on features like concreteness and polysemy. And when these data, um, digital, if somebody could close the back door, there's some people who I really inspired who uh, went out there and now are talking about what they're gonna do about this. They couldn't wait for the ending, so it's pretty exciting. Um, so when these um, data tools are used in conjunction with research on word complexity, we can begin to target words for, for um, instruction of indiv individual students. Today, I want to demonstrate very quickly the potential of digital resources for creating instruction around parsimonious vocabulary. I'm going to present a prototype of a not-for-profit group I work with in Silicon Valley called Text Genome. The foundation for the prototype is the 4,000 word families and what we do here is we put a word family in a grade level at which it appears initially um, with the greatest amount. As you see, the word families are spread across the grades. And please don't think that I'm proposing that students need instruction in every word for every grade level. In fact, I'm very much against that. And I'm making this database available as open access with great reluctance. What I'm interested in is adaptive instruction. So let me illustrate what we do here with some words from grades 9 to 10. We sort the words at a grade level into groups of 15 to 20. So we start with 450 words, sort them into groups of 15 to 20 based on 10 word features that are in my text analyzer. Te uh, features such as part of speech, um, age of acquisition, concreteness, and so on. So here are the words in the middle in a middle group in grades 9 to 10. And what we do is we identify, this is something that David Pearson, Michael Camille, and I talked about in an RRQ article in 2007. We identify words that typify the group. Next, what we do is we use a database of texts that students have a likelihood of encountering someday in school or in life. And we develop questions based on that. And depending on their performances, you either get instruction or you get next levels of assessment. Now, I'm offering this text genome prototype as an illustration of what's possible. 
Do know that we're always eager for partners, especially literacy researchers, who want to test our assumptions about whether, in fact, knowledge generalizes. So if you know installed, do you also really know inserted and guarantee? We have a rationale for that, but that is something that needs to be tested, as does the instruction. In conclusion, our models of text are few and have not been well articulated. But I believe that as a community, we have a lot of knowledge, but it's only through integrating this work, extending it, and providing educators with strong frameworks and principles that we're going to ensure that the students most in need receive the text they need. This attention to text features and diets isn't just hy hypothetical or a good idea. It's not just Freddie's good idea. Many of the comments that I've read and heard within our community post-November 8th have to do with the need to emphasize critical literacies, critical thinking with text, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. But for that to happen, students need to be doing the reading, not their teachers. Getting students onto the page with alacrity and proficiency is a necessary action. It's not sufficient by any means, but it's necessary if we're to increase educational equity and to sustain democratic ideals. And I believe strongly that ensuring that teachers have the knowledge and the will to support such proficiency is a primary obligation and contribution of this community here. That's what we contribute to a democratic society. I invite all of you to join me in supporting our teachers in becoming more knowledgeable and motivated in providing appropriate texts for all students, but especially the kids who depend on public schools to become highly literate. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can't see it. The okay. references. Okay. Thank you, Freddie, for your important and challenging talk. I want to thank you all for attending this plenary session and hope to see you this afternoon at Dr. Alan Luke's presentation at 3 o'clock, then again at Dr. Richard Milner's address from 4.45 to 6 p.m. when the 2016 Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Award and the Early Career Achievement Award will be presented. And also, one more thing, plan to attend the town hall meeting this evening, which has a new interactive format this year. Thank you.